Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the future of the water and wastewater industry and careers you didn't know about and the people that run it. And this is going to be episode number six, and we have a special guest. And again, we're live here at the uh, At Cave Technical Conference and Vendor Expo over at the AquaTurf. And with us, we have uh, a colleague of mine for many, many years, Mr. Peter Gallant. So, hi, Peter. How are you? Hey, Dave. Good. It has been many years, hasn't it? It, it has. Yes, it has. So, okay. Um, do tell. How did, how did you get into the water industry? I know you're, you're with Ty and Bond right now, but you started out your career, uh, when I first met you, you were at Aquarion. So how yep, did and before that, I was with a consulting firm called Malcolm Perney. It was actually kind of accidental that I got into the industry. I was interested in the environment and in water. But when I graduated school in 1984, okay. I was told all the jobs were in hazardous waste remediation. Really? So okay. I went into, uh, applied for a job in that field and uh, went into Malcolm Perney's offices and they say, you know, we don't, we don't have an opening there, but we do have something in drinking water. Would you like that? Okay. And uh, I started there and it's 35 plus years wow. since then. I worked there at... Uh, as a consultant, then worked for one of my clients there, was what was then Bridgeport Hydraulic Company, now Aquarion Water. Wow, wow, um, Bridgeport Hydraulic Company. Uh, was it 800 Lindley Street? 600. 600, I know. And they're still there. Yeah, it's, it's still, still there. there. Or 835 Main Street. Yeah, yeah, that's yep. that's the main, uh, that's yep. the head uh, the head, head head office down there and so forth. Uh, but I remember uh, first, first gentleman I became uh worked with when i got into the cross connection is bob starkey i don't know yeah, if you remember yeah i bob. remember bob yep, bob was sure. uh integral part of the cross connection uh field in connecticut he was the you know kind of the the man to go to as far as that goes so um so you know tell you and you've you've kind of uh transgressed and now you're on the engineering side so uh w when you were in school where did where did you go to school uh, I got an undergraduate degree from Tufts University. Okay. Uh, I actually got dual degrees in, in engineering, and then I wanted to round that out a little bit with some liberal arts, so I got a biology degree. Oh, okay. And it took me an extra year to do that. Okay. Uh, and then got my master's in environmental engineering at Stanford University out in California. Oh, okay. All right. Fantastic. Now, when you, uh, y y your first water job, what, what did that consist of? So, as I said, I started out in consulting, um, working in New Jersey. I did a lot of water treatment process stuff, okay, which was really kind of cool. We would travel around the country doing bench scale testing and, and pilot testing of different treatment technologies, okay, and then take the results of that would be brought back to design new treatment plants. Wow, wow, okay. Now, um, you know, obviously, the technology <laughs> when you and I started has uh, moved. <laughs> farther a lot a lot farther along now how, how has that changed so treatment? the treatment technology is is moved along you know not it the uh the engineering world is pretty conservative and moves kind of slowly yeah yeah um so but there have been advances in in technology for treatment as we've detected new contaminants at lower and lower concentrations and have had uh -huh. to treat for them um, and big technology in terms of process automation and monitoring okay yeah. and control we're Plants that used to be manned 24 hours a day right. back in the day can now be manned eight Remotely, hours. Remotely. You know, yeah. the, the wonders of SCADA. <clears throat> the wonders of SCADA. <laughs> yeah, as far as that goes. Which brings up other challenges, too, as far as now in the, the world of cyber uh, and all of that uh, and stuff. So that, that that's great. So, um, you know, I know your, what were your, your job responsibilities at Aquarion now? So I started at Aquarion. Um, one of the treatment plants that I had done the bench testing with at the consulting firm. Okay went into design, okay, and I went to Aquarion, then Bridgeport Hydraulic Company, to, to, as a project manager to oversee the consultant okay. who was designing the, that treatment plant. Okay. Um, we went through two treatment plants, and then I kind of broadened my responsibilities and um, had oversight of their engineering group, which had um, did all aspects of planning, design, and construction of water infrastructure. So. Uh, on the planning side, where are we going to invest our money? Yep. Uh, do we have enough water to meet the needs of the community into right. the future? Um, how are we going to plan for drought and respond to drought? Yes. And then on the infrastructure side, everything from new dams and treatment plants to water mains, pump stations, storage tanks, 
So it's kind of source to tap. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, how many? How many? Uh, now, obviously, uh, Aquarian is is an investor-owned company. So, yes. how how many uh, how many customers does uh, uh, Aquarian have now? So Aquarian, ha- they're now in three states. Okay. They're in uh, Connecticut, where most of their customers are, as yeah. well as Mass in New Hampshire. And uh, I'm speaking off the top of my head here, but I think they've got serve about 650,000 people. Okay, I know Maybe you have 200,000 customers in Connecticut. I know you manage just a couple small systems, I think, in East Hampton. I think uh, they've got a small system in East Hampton. They they've got people don't know how many water systems there are in Connecticut. There's um, over 500 community water systems in Connecticut, and I think about 2,000 regulated public water systems in wow. Connecticut. Yeah, and uh, Connecticut Corian owns about 70 of those su- right. community systems. Connecticut Water has a similar number. Well, I remember uh, god, uh, you know, I've been with Portland now uh, just south of 50 years and uh, I know one of the, the and you probably remember the name John Witten's elder. Yeah, absolutely. John yeah. used to manage a lot of these mom and pop systems yep. which were 10, 15, 20 houses, campgrounds, or yep. whatever. And then when John exited, you know, uh, you know the water scene, you know, what are we going to do with these systems? And this, the, you know, the Department of Public Health says, okay, Quarion, you take this one. Connecticut Water, you take that one. And well, there's a lot of investment needed, as particularly as the infrastructure is aging. Sure. And these small systems can't afford to invest right. as they need to. Um, which is an advantage of the re- regionalization and consolidation. Sure, sure. You know, it's strength in numbers, actually, you know, for sure, uh, as far as that goes. So now, you know, you migrated, you know, obviously out of uh, uh, Aquarion, and now you're, you're with Ty and Bond. I know Ty and Damod uh, did an extensive study uh, for us at the town of Portland, you know, as because we're a, uh, uh, basically we buy uh, um, the majority of our water from uh, from MDC, but I know you guys did a pretty exhaustive study on, you know the needs of our system okay uh and that's you know uh i think you were involved yeah yeah that's a lot of what we do so time bond is a without trying not to sound like a commercial we're a mid-sized engineering firm in new england about 450 employees um with offices in connecticut massachusetts yep um now we're in new hampshire maine and new york <clears throat> and that's a lot of what we do what we did in portland is Developed capital improvement plans. So yep. went through the system, looked at the the age and condition of all the equipment, yep. and developed a long term capital improvement plan, and then looked at what the impact of those investments would be sure. on rates. Right. So right. To help to help planning what your what your rates would be looking like into the future. Yeah, and then like every other water system in the country, uh, you know, everybody's uh, infrastructure is aging. Okay, and a lot of times, see, especially when you're dealing with a small town or a small system, okay, uh, there's often uh, a too much month at the end of the money. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, too much month at the end of the money. You know, so yeah. it's, it's the So you need thing. to be able to prioritize. You yes. To be able to. And to plan. Right. Yeah. You need you to know, be ca- effe- efficient with your spending and, and make sure you're spending it in the right spots. Yeah, and I think one of the effect I think you're involved in, uh, in and perhaps uh, we'll be doing some more work for the town of Port. We're going through a, a study some uh, for uh, some more water sources right. in, in town to, so we can be more sustainable on our own as far as that goes. So, uh, you know, I, I know you were involved in the presentation, then, so t- tell us how you went about that. Yeah, so we responded that the, the town put out a, an, RFP. an RFP request for proposals yep. for engineering consultants. We were one of several that submitted our qualifications and were fortunate enough to be selected to interview in front of the, the panel yeah, yeah. where we presented our qualifications, our understanding of what the town's needs are, yep. the approach that we would take if hired to do that work. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And... Uh, now we're waiting to hear back. There you go, and uh, you know we got to keep keep the ball rolling here as yeah. far as that goes. So, uh, you know, from a standpoint of uh, now, obviously, uh, I think uh, you uh, you live in Weston now. I live in Trumbull. Trumbull, okay. Yeah. I know some someplace down there as far as that goes. So, home uh, of the 1989 Little League World Series. That's our claim to fame. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Wow. So. Uh, uh, on a personal, so so, what do you do for hobbies? I know, uh, I, I think you're, you're. I work. Yeah. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. I think your son just got married. What last year? Uh, he's engaged. He's engaged. He's just got engaged. So okay. He and and his fiance they live in Washington D.C. and they're getting married in October up in New York State. Oh, okay. So we're looking forward to well, that. There you and go. I have a daughter who lives in Bristol okay. and is now working at Torrington Water Company. Okay, nice. Yeah. Okay, she's working. Uh, 
with, with Susan. Susan. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, she's on the list too. So we're, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hook her up and get her down here as far as that goes. That's great. Uh, so you know, what, what do you you know? Do you have any hobbies do you do for fun? Do you do? You, do yeah, you know? I like I like to hike. I like to play golf. Okay. I, uh, I like to ski in the wintertime. Nice. Um, and lately, it's been walking the dogs. It's been the big hobby. They, they're the they benefited from all this work from home. Right? Getting walked three times a day, and well, I, it's the only th thing to do on the weekends. Yeah, and I think this uh, this uh, COVID has, has, I think, taught the industry as the whole commercial industry. Uh, you know that uh, you know we can uh, manage from home too. Yeah, <laughs> you know, as far as that goes, I there's think. a lot of advantages to it. I mean, what we uh, I don't have to get in the car and drive an hour to go sure. to to a meeting. I can save on gas and, yeah. and time there. I can attend meetings that I couldn't otherwise. Right. Um, and can be very efficient. What we miss is the the personal collaboration, the be able to, to talk face to face right. with people, right. and particularly young employees joining the company, trying to you know and keep them engaged and and incorporate them into the culture of the company. That's really the most and mentor right. them. That's really the most difficult thing. Well, I think this is the first time that we've been able to come together in that cave in two years. Right. You know, and I think uh, everybody's itching to do that and you know not, not not to mention you know we all need our ceus as far yeah. as that goes so but uh that's a, that's a big driving factor but but be able to you know again talk face to face uh as far as so how, how does your company um you know recruit uh new people i know as as far as you know the operators in, in connecticut you know we're all suffering from you know what we call the gray tsunami here you know right uh, the great resignation yes or whatever <laughs> and, and, and so forth so how, how does your company um you know work on a workforce succession yeah you know it's re it's recruiting and retention both are equally important yeah um and it is a tough time and if we had that solved uh you know we can make a lot of money if we had that net solved but there's there's a lot of uh, good people out there we've got a a um talent acquisition specialist okay. on staff okay and we're looking to, to grow that staff more using we do a lot with college career fairs okay um and using technology to reach out more recently to reach out to students um our internship program is a great way for folks to get to know us and us to get to know them uh -huh. um and then your your standard meeting people out at events like this and sure. using linkedin and other tools and uh to reach out to people well, I think, you know, from, from, from a standpoint of, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, interactions and so forth, and I know I taught the water and people class at, at Portland High School, up at Bloomfield High School and so forth, and, you know, I stressed to my students, okay, um, you, you can never underestimate um, the power of networking because you never know who you're going to shake hands or who you're going to meet that, you know, somewhere down the road, he's going to need you or you're going to need Absolutely. him. Absolutely. Someone once told me a story, I don't know if it's true or not, that uh, a guy who was laid off and looking for work at home brought his garbage down to the side of the road, talking to the, the garbage collector, yeah, yeah. mentioned that he was looking for work. The garbage collector went down a few more houses, connected with somebody who had an opportunity, put the two of them together. and there. I don't know if I believe it, but it's a good story. Well, no, it is, you know, and I think... Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are many uh, stories like that. Uh, you know that the, you know the, the chance interactions that that you see. You know at right. the grocery store and you know whatever. You know and uh, it, you, you get to meet different people and and different walks of life uh, and so forth. And I know um, you know talking with a lot of the uh, you know the folks that you know in, in the in the watershed. A lot of, a lot of the water utilities are you know are starving for you know replacing their succession chain of uh, you know certified operators and uh, you know the thing is obviously you know from an engineering standpoint we you know you guys are starving for for yeah absolutely uh, as well as the certified operators and the thing is is that you know if you can get into the, the water utilities as far as it's a and i've been stressing on a, on our podcast okay that uh, you don't necessarily have to start off with a college education to get get the ball rolling you can yep. get your foot in the door and most um uh, uh, water utilities. I know uh, on our second episode, I had uh, Maureen Resberg, who was the president of Connecticut Water, on, and uh, you know, Connecticut Water obviously is an investor owned just like Aquarion, um, and they uh, again have a, a very uh, a generous uh, tuition reimbursement, and uh, you know, as far as advancement into the into the company, yeah, they do. And 
You know, what I always told my kids is you got you to gotta like what you're doing. Whatever it is, you really have to – you're going to spend a lot of time working. you got to enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. And, I do, and I, there's a lot I like about the industry, the, the drinking water, public water supply industry. I like serving the community. I like the public health aspect. Sure. I like uh, protecting the environment. I like getting to know – uh, how systems work. Sure. Um, and I like working with the people. It's really a great industry. Well, plus the industry is, it's, you know, obviously uh, it, it's not uh, an industry that lends itself to outsourcing. You have to have boots on the ground right. to operate a system to, you know, you know, to read the water meters, to fix the main brakes, to, you know, do, to, do the engineering. Obviously, you know, a lot of the smaller uh, the smaller utilities don't have the depth and resources from an engineering side. That's why they call tie and bond. Right. You know, as far as that goes, but um, you know, they they it's all a a finely tuned machine that uh, the, the the puzzle pieces fit together one way or another. You know? And a lot of people don't think about it, right? It's kind of no. like, kind of like the offensive lineman in football. And you turn on, you tap, the water comes out. Unless there's a penalty, you never hear about it. You never think about it. Yeah, and how so true? Right. How so true? You know, and that that's the thing. You know, you got the lineman, defense, offense, and you know, you've got the, and it's a team effort. It really is. You right. Get to a point where everybody has their job on. It takes a village. You know, everybody has their job uh, uh, responsibilities, and uh, you know, you're going to see a lot of the. Uh, uh, things from a standpoint uh, that you're seeing in the in the presentations here, uh, from soup to nuts, you know, from treatment to uh, cross connections to you know regulations to SCADA to whatever. So uh, anyway, so yeah, a, lot, a lot of people ask why should I pay for water, and that's it. Ta it takes a village, right? There's a lot of effort that goes into that. If you uh, you're welcome to go up to the re reservoir and fill your own bucket and bring it home if you want. Yeah, but you're paying what you're paying for is everything that makes sure that that's clean, healthy water that comes out your tap when you need it. Well, you know, again, you know as well, uh, you know, I've been involved in the school systems for many, many years, and I, I did a program, oh, God, uh, about 20 years ago, I can remember. And, you know, you go in to do presentations in, this, in the schools, and we had to do, you know, all of the lead and copper education, okay? Mm -hmm. We we had a, a lead incident, so I had to go out and do, do the education program. So I was at uh, basically a, a middle school, and... Um, you know, you ask, ask students, <clears throat> you know where your water comes from. You know, you get the deer and headlight looks. Uh, you know, no, you yeah, just turn the water on. So I I brought uh, a trailer, okay, with a, a landscape trailer with band prices on it, okay, and I had 300-gallon uh, jugs of water on the uh, on the trailer. I says, okay, so I'm going to tell you, does anybody know how much the average household uses for, for water in a day? So... Everybody was guessing from, you know, from 100 to, to 1,000. And I said, so anyway, anyway. So I said, well, right, come out outside. So everybody, all the students came outside. Everybody carried a gallon jug in, and they put it on a riser in the, in the auditorium. And I says, you know what you just did? And they said, no. I says, you just carried in your daily yeah. water supply that yeah. you use in your house. And they think, oh, my gosh, you know. And you don't realize that... Uh, how much water an average household of four uses, okay, that you just turn on the tap and, you know, fill your glass. And there it is, and it's all drinking water quality. Yes, yes, and it has to meet regulations and, 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 and to go from there, but for sure. So anyway, um, so what are your plans for for, for, for the future? How, how long uh, yeah, you, you, you're getting to retirement age? <laughs> uh, yeah, it depends upon if you ask me or my wife. My wife would like me to work longer because I don't have too many of the hobbies that, you, oh, okay. that you asked about. Oh, okay. Uh, so I've got another three or five years left. Okay, yeah, uh, that's good. You know, that's the uh, type of thing I have to I have to keep busy, you know, yep. so it's, it's like, uh, you know, between myself and, you know, I also, you know, as you know, I own, a, own the music store. Uh, that's that's the, the, the other side of my... <laughs> My life is the musician side, so uh, there's a, there's a lot of varied uh, yeah, interest. I don't have that. Yeah, yeah. I could see myself uh, fading away. I don't know that I could go cold turkey. Oh, okay, I think I'll uh, fade away. All right, okay. Favorite sports teams? Oh, that's easy. Giants. Giants. Yankees. Yep. Rangers. Okay. New York. New, New York, York. New York. New York. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I grew up in New Jersey. So. Fantastic. Okay. Now, this is a, one of one of the questions that I asked on my on my music podcast. Okay, if um, if you had uh, one food that that you would be comfortable with eating every day, what would it be? One food that I would like to eat every day, what would it be? Uh, that's a tough question. 
I think it would be uh, probably some kind of Mexican food. Mexican food. Yeah. Okay. Is that, good, is that good enough? Yeah, no. Uh, burrito, I, nice big burrito. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's amazing, you know. Uh, and one of the other questions I ask, okay, if you were stuck on a desert island, okay, and you had a desert island album that you had to listen to, what would you, do you have any musical? You know, that would probably be uh, the Allman Brothers, Fillmore East. There you go, Fillmore East, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, J-Mo is, is, I know. Uh, is is a good friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, played with him many times. Uh, in fact, uh, he's gonna he's gonna be on my music one of my music podcasts. So. Oh, great! I'll listen for that. One. And he's uh, he's just getting back out on the uh, on the road. He had his uh, he had his knee replaced, and uh, he just did his first uh, uh, tour, so to speak, a mini tour. And he says it was it was great to get back on the stage. Yeah, so. I bet. but he's a great guy. So yeah, Allman Brothers, A B B, for sure. Yeah, well, it's it's right now. He's the only one that's left. You know. Between that goes and now um, Dwayne is out there obviously uh, um, and uh, um, the lineage Tedeschi trucks is another yeah you know. yeah absolutely that's well it's a nephew yeah it is it yeah. is you know as far as that goes and uh, some great music so great well Peter hey thanks so much for coming over hey, and thanks uh, for having me and uh, uh, again the whole focus of the podcast is you know to let younger students know you know some of the careers that maybe they would never think about Okay, uh, in the in the water industry, uh, whether it be engineering, operator, uh, certification, whatever, uh, uh, the careers are here. They're steady. They're uh, they're secure positions, and they're well paid. So again, so Peter Gallant from Tie and Bond, and uh, this is the future of the water and wastewater industry. I'm your host Dave Kosminski, and the careers you didn't know about, and the people that run them. And uh, I want to thank Mr. Peter Gallant. Uh, from Ty and Bond, uh, a colleague of mine for many years to coming on. So thank you, Peter. Thank you. All righty.